You're listening to Nest Talk, the best and most elite Baltimore Ravens podcast on the internet. Now, here's your host, Christopher Linfont. Ladies and gentlemen of the Ravens flock, my name is Christopher Linfont, and I'm back here with another episode of Nest Talk, the best and most elite Baltimore Ravens podcast on the entire internet. We are inching closer and closer to draft day. Today is April 10th, 2019, uh, and we are recording this at about 1.20 in the afternoon. Um, didn't have an episode of Nest Talk last week. I didn't feel like there was a lot of Ravens news to break down into one episode, so I decided to wait another week uh, and kind of compile all the news you know, that comes out between then and now, uh, and of course my opinionated stuff. Um, into this episode just to have a better episode for you because I always want to make sure I have the best content coming to my loyal listeners. Now, again, um, the Ravens are getting prepared here for draft season. Obviously, uh, there's about two, maybe three weeks left to the draft, somewhere in between there. It starts on, I think, April 25th. If I, Yeah, so about two weeks uh, from tomorrow, two weeks from tomorrow, actually, uh, Thursday, um, so the Ravens really at the twilight hour of this draft process here, but we're not done. We're going to keep covering it right through and after the draft. We're just going to keep going. So, um, you know, the Ravens obviously are tied to a wide receiver as, you know, what their primary pick is going to ma- most likely be, either that or an edge rusher. Uh, I just saw, I think it was Mel Kuyper's mock draft today. I believe it was Mel Kuyper said that the Ravens were going to pick uh, Cullen Farrell, the edge rusher from uh, Clemson, which would be a nice pickup for them, um, but you know it's gonna, either going to be you know edge rusher, um, inside linebacker is a maybe. I don't know if there's anybody that they'd want to get in the first round as an inside linebacker or wide receiver. Um, so obviously the Ravens need a wide receiver, and they actually helped fill the void at wide receiver um, with one free agent signing that happened uh, a few days ago. The Ravens signed a wide receiver Seth Roberts from the Oakland Raiders. He was cut as a salary cap casualty from that organization. Uh, they signed him to a one-year contract. Now, this this move for Seth Roberts, um, some people basically say he's Chris Moore 2.0. Um, you know, some people think that this isn't really going to do much for us. Uh, I like the move, and, and I'll tell you why I like the move. Um, mainly because it adds depth to this 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 wide receiver core. Um, if you know anything about Seth Roberts, he's not going to be your number one guy. Uh, consistently, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018. Uh, his four years he played with the Raiders. Well, he played five if you count 2014, but he was an undrafted rookie, didn't play a single game. Played in um, two two seasons of 16 games, 2015, 2016, 17 and 18 he played in 15. Um, but, you know, consistently getting around 400 yards. He got 480 in 2015, a th- little bit down in the next year, 397. Uh, the next year in 2017, 455, and then 2018, 494 for his best receiving uh, season. Um, so what I think Seth Roberts will do is essentially just, you know, bring out um, some very nice, um, you know, he, he's going to be a complement to whatever the Ravens add at wide receiver. The Ravens are not done. All right, I'll tell you right now, the Ravens are going to add a wide receiver in, in the, within their first two picks. All right. Pretty much everybody's going to agree with me on that I mean, because you can't run an offense with Chris Moore, Seth Roberts, and Willie Sneed as your receivers and Jordan Lasley and G. Little Scott as your, you know, kind of depth guys there. Uh, all those receivers I think are good. I think I'm really excited to see what Lasley and Scott can do this year. They're going to get a lot of touches. Um, but Willie Sneed, he, he has a role slot. Chris Moore has a role. Right, he's a supportive wide receiver. So is Seth Roberts. There's no true number one. The Ravens set themselves up fantastically, I think, here to find a number one to make this group mesh very well together with the addition of Seth Roberts. Um, you know, he's not a pro bowler, he's not an all pro guy, uh, but he is a solid receiver. Um, and he has had some drop problems. I will say that about him. Um, you know, Raiders fans talking about that's maybe one of the reasons the Raiders got rid of him because of his drop problems, but you know, he had in his his first year playing 58 percent catch rate, 49 the next year not good, 66 in 2017 and 70 in 2018. So he has improved, um, but you know that's still going to be a problem. The Ravens have to go out and find a guy who's going to be a consistent catcher, number one wide receiver. Uh, if you listen to my previous podcast, if you read my articles on BaltimoreFeather.com, or if you watch his prospect review, I still think Nikhil Harry would be that number one guy for the Ravens. Um, 
and that could be, you know, draft Nikhil, Nikhil, Nikhil Harry, or maybe even A.J. Brown. I'm going to be reviewing him in a few days as per request on the YouTube channel. Um, but, you know, I think that if you add a guy who's going to be that number one receiver to this core, it's going to be a very good core, and a core that's young, it's talented. Uh, all these guys are young. I think Willie Snead would be the oldest. Um, or maybe Seth Roberts, I don't know. But they're all under 30 here, and these are guys that are going to mesh well uh, with Lamar Jackson. Now, I also say that, say that specifically about Seth Roberts is because he's a very good downfield blocker. I mean, a very good downfield blocker. You want to add guys who can do it because with what the Ravens are going to do, they're not going to just be reserving Lamar's plays you know, to passing, right? They, they want to make Lamar pass more than he did last year, but he's still going to be that running quarterback. You're never going to take that aspect away from him. And if you can do it effectively and if you can get these blockers who know how to do it at the wide receiver position, right, you're going to have a, a much better time rushing down the field. Maybe you're going to get more yards, more, you know, those blocks are going to give Lamar Jackson more time to get out of bounds, preserve himself. Um, these are all things that the Ravens are trying to calculate in building a new team. You can obviously see that Eric DeCosta and, uh, and um, not Ozzie Newsom, John Harbaugh are working together here, matching scheme with, with what the Ravens are doing in free agency uh, in the talent pool. And I think they're doing a good job so far. I like the addition of Seth Roberts. We don't, unfortunately, know the contract aside from its one-year deal. What does that mean monetarily-wise? I wouldn't think it's a whole lot. He was cut by the Raiders late in the process as a salary cap casualty. And, of course, it's, this does not go against the Ravens' um, compensatory pick formula, only guys who are uh, hit the free agent market, you know, with by being um, expired, uh, their contracts expired, count towards that compensatory pick formula. A cut would not take away a comp pick for the Ravens next year, and that was crucial. That's probably why they really wanted Seth Roberts to add him to this receiving core because they can still get those comp picks. The Ravens did that a lot with Ozzie Newsom. Now they're going to be doing it with Eric DaCosta. So I think it's a great signing as long as they didn't pay him a whole lot, which I really doubt they did. That wouldn't be a Ravens move to you know go out and pay him $10 million for one year. Wouldn't make a lot of sense. So uh, I really like this move. A-plus the Ravens. Eric DaCosta is doing a fantastic job as GM so far, not overpaying anybody, getting quality guys when you find them. And again, this is a good, this is a good salary cap casualty pick uh, because he's only 28, right? So... Um, that's a, that's a major plus. He's got a lot of time left. He's entering his prime. Maybe he'll even be better than he was in Oakland for Baltimore. We'll see. Uh, and he said he wanted to play with Lamar Jackson. So that confirms that receivers out there do want to play with Lamar Jackson. He does have that allure that some other quarterbacks don't. Uh, and, you know, we got to find guys like Seth Roberts that are going to come in here and want to just compete, you know, you know, get down and dirty and compete in the trenches as a blocker, as a receiver, as everything. Uh, I can't wait to see what he can do for us next year. But now talking about next year, before we, we, we move on into, you know, why hasn't this player resigned? Who are the Ravens going to pick? Who are they interested in? Uh, we have some other Ravens news we have to talk about real first, um, right first, and that is the preseason schedule that was released yesterday. Now the Ravens are scheduled to play four preseason games. Last year they played five uh, because of the Hall of Fame game when Ray Lewis was enshrined as a Hall of Famer. Uh, so was Brian Urlacher, and they paired the Ravens up with the Bears to play in that game. Um, but this year the Ravens really don't have that far to travel in any of their games. Um, really, not far at all. Uh, the first preseason game is scheduled, and, and these are without times. The, the, the NFL hasn't given any times yet, but the first preseason game is scheduled for Thursday, August 6th against the Jacksonville Jaguars at Baltimore. Uh, and that will be, precursor to that game, will be the joint practices the Ravens scheduled with the Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, Thursday, August 15th, um, the Green Bay Packers come to Baltimore. No no weird practice with that. Uh, and all these games are Thursdays, which is kind of weird, but we'll, we'll go with it. Thursday, August 22nd, Baltimore goes to Philadelphia, just up the road, I-95. Uh, and they also have joint practices with Philadelphia for the week before. Uh, and Thursday, August 29th, Baltimore travels down I-95 to Washington. Uh, so they don't even have to get on a plane. Uh, I think I saw someone say their total trip is going to be like 280 miles in those four weeks. So they're staying very close to home. Uh, and the NFL always wants to try to do that for these you know, players because um, it's just easier to be around the team facilities, especially with guys, you know, first years and stuff. And just bring them in, have them get familiar with the area. 
uh, and that's always good. You know, in the preseason, it doesn't really matter if you're traveling across the country. Uh, you really kind of, you know, make them stay home. And that's good for the Ravens. They have, you know, a really not easy schedule, but they have a schedule that's going to work with them. Uh, and I think one that's going to be beneficial for them because they're playing very good teams in here. You've got Jacksonville. I mean, not so great last year, but I think they're much more talented this coming year, especially at the quarterback position with Nick Foles. We'll see if he plays. He does, and he might not. It's the first game. Uh, but the experience playing with the Jacksonville Jaguars uh, and what Coach Doug Marone is doing down there will be good for the young guys in Baltimore. Green Bay is going to be an interesting team this year. New coach, Matt LaFleur. you got Aaron Rodgers, as always. It'll be a good experience for the young defense uh, and whoever else you know they add to the defense because they will add defense. If there's anything the Ravens are going to do in the draft, it's add defensive players. Uh, so that's a good matchup. Baltimore and Philadelphia, Doug Peterson, fantastic coach. Been to the playoffs the past few years, won that Super Bowl a few years ago. Um, what the Ravens can do with them, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, that RPO style, get that exposure with the defense. Uh, and finally, Washington, big overhaul going on down there, but it's always good to get that experience uh, with NFC opponents like that uh, who are doing maybe some more unconventional things. You know, I got Case Keenum now. I think Adrian Peterson's down there yet again. So this will be an interesting team to watch. Uh, the, the Washington Redskins will be. So to segue back into the draft here, um, the Ravens are showing interest in in running back, which is very strange, I think, because right now they've got Mark Ingram, they've got Gus Edwards, they've got Kenneth Dixon uh, in the backfield, a good good trio, without a doubt. Going into uh, 2019, you've got a proven veteran who can do it in case, you know, Gus Edwards and Kenneth Dixon burst. Uh, You've got Mark Ingram there. Uh, But the Ravens are interested in running backs. Uh, They worked out veteran running back Eddie Lacy, uh, a.k.a. Feast Mode. Uh, I'm not sure if that would work out for the Ravens. He could never keep his way down with the Packers or the Seattle Seahawks, uh, and he kind of just fell out of the league after a few years. Uh, but they also brought in Josh Jacobs and Damian Harris to draft prospect meetings, both Alabama running backs, both expected to go in the first three rounds. Josh Jacobs would probably go in the first round. Um, you know, is this a ruse or are the Ravens seriously interested in adding a running back? And what I will tell you is... Uh, it's difficult to discern because, really, there's two thoughts I have. The, the first is they could obviously be pulling a ruse, directing um, attention away from what they really want to want to draft here. They they brought in a few wide receivers on team business. We'll go over that in a few minutes here. Um, but maybe they really want a wide receiver and they want you know teams to think that they're going to draft these running backs uh, in in Josh Jacobs and they add Damian Harris for good measure. Uh, to get, you know, some guys picked up earlier in the draft um, than the Ravens, you know, need to get, right, until the pick. Um, you know, if they show continual interest in Josh Jacobs, a team above them who is thinking about Josh Jacobs, or, you know, a team below them who really wants them might trade up, and that would push somebody the Ravens want or a position the Ravens want, like wide receiver, maybe down a few pegs to the point where they can get them. So that's possible. Uh, but the second thought is that the Ravens um, really do want a, a running back here, and they want to replace who I would expect to be Kenneth Dixon. If they're going to replace anybody, it's definitely not going to be Mark Andrews. They just signed him, and I doubt they would replace Gus Edwards after last year. But Kenneth Dixon, you know he's got these injury problems, the suspension he had a few years ago, very annoying for the Baltimore Ravens. They can't really rely on him anymore. Um, if they brought him, If they brought a new running back into Baltimore, they could potentially move on from Kenneth Dixon and, and what – you know, he represents for this team. Um, I'm not really sold that they would do that, especially in the first round when you have big needs like, you know, interior offensive line, edge rusher, inside linebacker, and of course wide receiver, the biggest need of all, I think. Um, You know, you have these needs. Do you really want to go and, and add to a positional group that you already have a lot of? I mean, they did it a few years ago when they drafted... Marlon Humphrey in the first round. They had a lot of cornerbacks. They had just brought in Brandon Carr, and then they go out and make a surprise. They don't take O.J. Howard at a position they need. They don't take uh, Reuben Foster at a position they need. They grab Marlon Humphrey, cornerback. You know, the the secondary was good at that point. They were fine. They could have rolled with what they had, but they chose Marlon Humphrey, and it turned out to be a very good decision. Um, you know, they could do the same thing with Josh Jacobs here. I'm not saying they will. I kind of lean more towards the side of they're doing their due diligence or it's a ruse here. Um, But it's definitely possible the Ravens go after Josh Jacobs in the first round. Anything is possible with this team. You never know who they're going to draft. They're very good at hiding it. 
Um, no one was really expecting Marlon Humphrey 2017. I mean, we all thought it was going to be uh, either O.J. Howard or Reuben Foster. And thank God it was Marlon Humphrey because Marlon Humphrey is a fantastic player for Baltimore. And looking back, I mean, I would have picked him over and over and over again if I had the opportunity. Um, but the Ravens made a good choice then, and I hope they make a good choice this uh, draft too. Um, but, you know, what would be a bad choice for the Ravens would be to draft a tight end. Now, there's been a lot of talk on Twitter, on blogs, everywhere about drafting Noah Fant. Um, and this comes from, from you may know him as at Adam B. Moore on Twitter. Um, you know, he, he's a writer for RussellStreetReport.com, a, a fellow Ravens blog out there. And he basically made the, 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 the claim, uh, he made the pitch for drafting Noah Fant, tight end from Iowa, uh, basically on on the premise that you would convert him to wide receiver. Because, you know, with Hayden Hurst, Mark Andrews, and the recently re-signed Nick Boyle, adding another tight end in the first round would be kind of ludicrous at this point. Um, especially after you just drafted two last year and re-signed one this year. I mean, th- that would just be insane. Uh, but he thinks that the way Noah Fant measures up on paper would be fantastic to move out to, you know, the, the X spot or the Z spot on the, on the uh, outside as a wide receiver. Uh, and I just don't think that's a good idea, right? I wrote a whole column about this. Um, basically, you know, what you get in a tight end is a guy who almost always relies on the matchups. A tight end is put in a position where a, a traditionally a linebacker is too slow to cover him and a cornerback is too small. But if you put him on the outside, you lose the matchup, right? He's paired up against the linebacker to start. If he makes a cut and goes towards the corner, that linebacker can't catch up. And then he can body a cornerback to, to keep going. But if you put him against just a cornerback, he'll be covered well. That, that cornerback may have the size disadvantage, maybe, uh, depending on the corner. But it's not like he's going to beat that corner anywhere. That corner's got a lot more speed probably than, than a tight end usually does. Now, Noah Fant has a lot of speed to him specifically. Um, but what does, where does that come? I mean, is he benefiting at Iowa from the matchups or is he just a stellar athlete that would work anywhere? Now, I would have no problem if the Ravens in the third or fourth round decided, hey, this is a good idea. Let's just try it, right? Fourth round pick. This guy's a good tight end. Let's see what happens if we move him to wide receiver. I mean, that's fine. But in the first round, uh, it's way too risky for me because in the first round, you have to hit. You have to hit big because the contracts you're giving them uh, and, and, and just the, the spot of the pick, the value of that pick, you have to hit. You cannot afford to miss first round picks. And I think to take a player in the first round with the intention of transferring him to another position where we don't know if it would work, where there's no guarantee, no real indication other than on paper it looks good, that it would work. Um, I don't think that would work out well uh, nine times out of ten for the Ravens. Now, maybe Noah Fant specifically could do it. I'm not saying he can't do it. Um, but I just think it's way too risky for the Ravens to try, uh, especially if there's another receiver like Nikhil Harry. Or maybe a- I haven't looked at A.J. Brown yet, but maybe A.J. Brown uh, in the first round at 22. And, you know, they can just pick and draft there. Maybe they want to add interior, or maybe they want to go after Cullen Farrell. Uh, off the edge. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't, I mean, it, I think it would just be a very big gamble for the Ravens at this point. A very big gamble, and I don't think they can afford to do it in the first round, especially, you know, John Harbaugh may have got that extension, but let's 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 be real here. His job is on the line still. You know, it's still on the line because, you know, if he misses the playoffs again, he'll get another year, but if he misses them twice, he's out. Um, so, you know, the Ravens have to make good picks here. We can't afford to have another 2015 draft. Right, where we go, Brashad Perryman, and then Max Williams. We cannot afford to do that. Uh, the Ravens have to make good draft picks here. Uh, so, no offense, I don't think he would be, you know, in that discussion at 22. Um, but, you know, players who might be drafted by the Ravens, there's lots of them. Um, and the Ravens have made a lot of, of, of meetings with players, the Senior Bowl, you know, the, the Combine, bringing these guys in to visits. And I just want to go over the players who have met with the Ravens so far. You've got Nick Allegretti, uh, center from Illinois. Ben Bangu, Bangau, I forget how to pronounce his name, but he's a good, I saw him on tape. Um, I think I was watching Hakeem Butler's tape. Yeah, that's coming out in the next few days here. Hakeem Butler's tape, I was watching it. 
and I said to myself, oh my god, right? Like, this guy is making plays that they didn't have to do with Hakeem Butler. Uh, they brought him in on two visits. I think they met him, uh, I don't, I, I forget where, but they met him twice already. Uh, Mike Bell, they're looking at the safety from Fresno State. Marquise Blair, safety from Utah. Uh, Hakeem Butler, Iowa State wide receiver. Uh, Max Crosby, defensive end from Eastern Michigan. Interesting uh, guy right there. I'd be interested to see what he they do with him. Andre Dillard, offensive tackle from Washington State. I don't think they're going to go after a tackle early. Andre Dillard is, I think, projected mainly in the first two rounds. Uh, so that would be kind of a weird pick if the Ravens decide to go with him. Jalen Ferguson, uh, defensive end, 3-4 outside linebacker, Louisiana Tech. Uh, very interesting player. Smaller school, but LA Tech can always be good. I uh, haven't really looked at him yet, but I want to. They've also looked at Jazz Ferguson, Northwestern State, uh, wide receiver, Lamont Gaylord, uh, guard from Georgia, Ulysses Gilbert III, outside linebacker slash inside linebacker from Akron. Uh, you've, of course, got uh, Damon Harris, the running back from Alabama. So is Josh Jacobs, Alabama on here. It's two running backs. Uh, they also looked at Daryl Henderson, running back from Memphis. Uh, Michael Jackson, cornerback from Miami. Uh, I've heard good things about him in this, this process so far. Uh, Jalen Jelks, I've heard some good things about him, too, from Oregon, uh, the defensive end slash 3-4 outside linebacker. Uh, Justin Lane, cornerback from Michigan State. I know Eric McCoy is a guy who is being projected all over the place. Some people think he's a first-round guy. Some people think he's a third-round guy. Guard slash center out of Texas A&M would be a nice pickup if, for the Ravens if they found him in the third round. If he was there, I would just be ecstatic that they could get him there. Uh, I think he's probably a, a high second-round guy. Uh, Sharif Miller, defensive end, Penn State. You're looking at Brandon Moore here, of course, Mer- Maryland center. Uh, not the only Maryland player on this list, of course. You've also got Reggie White. Uh, I'm sorry, not Reggie White Jr. Trey Watson. I was looking at the wrong thing here. Inside linebacker, Reggie White Jr. from Monmouth, the wide receiver. Uh, and, of course, Anthony Nelson, defensive end from Iowa. Ed Oliver from Houston, the defensive tackle, projected to go very high in this draft. Charles Amenahu from Texas. I've been looking at it for a while now. I think he's pretty good. Uh, Trey Watson, I said already. And, of course, Chase Winovich, defensive end out of Michigan. Uh, the hardball connection right there. Now, uh, out of all these players, who do I think the Ravens have a lot of interest in? I would say it's got to be Eric McCoy. Right, guard slash center. I mean, that would be a big pickup if they could get him in the third round. Um, because some people project him to go to the third round. I think he's a really early second round pick, maybe late set, first round pick. I mean, he's probably that good. But if he falls to the third round and he just lands in the Ravens' lap, there's no way we don't take him. Uh, I like Charles Amenahu. I think that they are definitely considering him. Of course, you got Trey Watson. The Maryland guys always are going to be looking at these Maryland players. Him and, of course, his teammate Brendan Moore, the center. Uh, I think that they're also, you know, Hakeem Butler, a guy who's making a lot of buzz around the Ravens' lock on Twitter right now. Um, I have a I have a prospect review for him. It is scheduled, hopefully, to come out tomorrow on Thursday. So I'm not going to comment on him. You should watch or read the article about that. Um, next up on. Uh, of what I think that they might go after here or who they might go after. I would not be surprised um, if they ended up getting um, Jalen Jelks or Michael Jackson, especially if they slide, you know, in their draft stock, you know, to some of the later rounds. Not sure, you know, if they will, but we'll see. Um, and, and, you know, that's about it, I think, for these, these visits so far. I think the Ravens still have more visits to do, but, you know, we're going to be monitoring the situation here and seeing, you know, who they who gets the visits uh, and who doesn't. And a lot of the times the, the, they're really looking at trying to either validate something they think about the player or find out more about the player when they have these visits. Uh, it's not always that it's just interest. Maybe it's, you know, a guy has has a perceived problem or they, they think he's really good and want to confirm it. Maybe they know something already about a player and they just don't even want to visit. They want him so badly that they don't, because all these visits are public, they don't want him on the visit. Maybe, maybe not. Um, that wraps up the visits for today's episode. If there's more next week, we'll probably talk about it. Uh, and there's one more topic I want to talk about before we go into our draft prospect of the week, and that is where the heck is Brent Urban? Where'd he go? I mean, honestly, I expected Brent Urban to re-sign with the Baltimore Ravens um, fairly quickly in the process. And here we are, April 10th, and nobody has signed Brent Urban. Where is Brent Urban? The Ravens gave him a one-year deal last year, a prove-it deal. Uh, it wasn't for much. I don't remember the exact number, but it was a very, you know, inexpensive deal. And 
he did very well, I thought. He played in all the games. Every single game he played. Did well on the inside. Contributed well for the defense as a defensive end. Um, and he's just, poof, gone. I mean, where did he go? The Ravens can probably sign him for very cheap. Maybe he's holding out for a better offer. Maybe they're trying to, you know, some team out there wants to get that post May whatever to get the comp pick for him. But um, I don't know exactly where he went. Uh, and it's been kind of puzzling to me that nobody signed that nobody signed him. He's a good play. He's a very good player. He's has injury problems, but he's a very good player. He's a good defensive end. Uh, there's no question in my mind. He's not, not going to wrap up a lot of sacks because that's not his job in a in a Ravens three four right. He's more of a run run assist guy. He's just a big body in that line, and he's he did it well this year. He made some nice tackles. He made good plays, um, but he's somehow still on the market. I'm very concerned about this. Uh, I would love him to come back to Baltimore, especially on a, an expensive deal, which I think that he would probably agree to at this point. Um, and and Eric DaCosta said, right player, right price, but no signing of Brent Urban. So I'd love to see him come back to Baltimore, uh, but right now he is MIA. No one really knows where he is or where he'll go in 2019. Okay, to wrap up today's episode, I want to talk a little bit about our draft prospect of the week. Yesterday I looked at Hakeem Butler, but I also am going to look at another player in the next coming few days as per request. And I was already thinking about doing this, but someone on, on YouTube comments requested that we, we take a look at A.J. Brown the junior old Miss wide receiver, and I, you know, I'm encouraged by what I I, I know about him, uh, and, and what I, you know, I've seen of him. I've seen some of his plays so far. I haven't looked in depth at the tape. I've selected the tape today that I'm going to watch, uh, hopefully today. So I would like to get his prospect review out maybe Friday, but there's no promises on this because it's a little bit last minute for it. Uh, Hakeem Butler supposed to come out tomorrow, so I'll see if I can get these both in. Um, but AJ Brown, Jr., Old Miss wide receiver, he's six foot, uh, two twenty six pounds. He's got three, thirty two and seven eighth inch arm length, uh, nine and three fourths inch hand size, forty yard dash, four point four nine seconds. So that's decent speed there. Uh, Nineteen bench press reps, vertical jump, thirty six point five inches in the air, and broad jump one twenty, uh, you know, inches. Um, not the most phenomenal stats, but I mean, across the board, they're pretty good for his uh, position, his size. Um, he can make plays. He can definitely make plays. I saw him in some of the plays that, you know, when I was watching the DK Metcalf tape, uh, he, he looks pretty good. And I think that A.J. Brown will probably be a first round receiver if maybe maybe he falls into the second, but, but he could very well be, well, he should be available for the Ravens 22. I don't see why he wouldn't be uh, unless he gets picked a few before, right? He'll be in that. 18 to 26 range, right? That's probably where he'll go, 18 to 26. And the Ravens are right there at 22. There's a good chance the Ravens have him. I think he'd probably be there. Um, I, I'm going to look at him sometime between now and tomorrow, and I'm going to analyze him well, and I really want to see what he comes out to be. Uh, but I think he's going to be uh, he's gonna be fun to watch, I think. So we'll talk about him maybe a little bit next week or, or just you know check out our prospect review. That's hopefully going to come out on Friday. Uh, again, no guarantees, but I hope it will come out on Friday. Um, so that's it for today's episode of Nest Talk. Again, Nest Talk episode 32, uh, here, April 10th, 2019, just 15 days away from the NFL draft. Uh, we're getting really close down the wire here, guys, and I can't wait to see who the Ravens pick with every pick. You know, a lot of people, you know, will watch the first round of the NFL draft and call it quits after that. No, 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 no. We're watching every round, every round, every pick because, and even the undrafted guys, because there are quality players all across the board. I mean, every year the Ravens find somebody deep, you know, whether it's Kyle Juszczyk that one year. We got Brandon Williams late. Um, you know, um, last year, I don't think we drafted. Well, we drafted Mark Andrews in the third. Um, and so we, so did Orlando Brown came from the third. I mean, last year's draft class was a very good um, draft class. If we go back to it here just for a second, let's just segue um, for a second. I know that I said this was the end of uh, – of the episode, but you know, again, about these drafts, um, you look at it Hayden Hurst, Lamar Jackson, top the first round, but they found quality players throughout. You look at um, guys that they took in the later rounds, you know, Mark Andrews, uh, um, Orlando Brown Jr., Zeus Jr., um, you know, 
solid players last year. Kenny Young, very solid player last year. Julio Scott, Jordan Lasley, they have good potential. Deshaun Elliott, injured, but has great potential as a safety. Greg Sinat, tackle. Bradley Bozeman, center. And Zach Seiler, you know, didn't see much of them at all last year, but I think they've got great potential for the Ravens. Uh, and But the, the third-round picks last year were very good for the Ravens. Um, and, and the Ravens demonstrated that they can get these players deep in the draft. And we always find out guys, you know, later on who are either undrafted or really late in the rounds uh, come up and do very well for us. Um, but that will be today's uh, the end of today's episode finally now. Um, I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Nest Talk. You can find Nest Talk at Nest Talk on Twitter or uh, hit us up on iTunes to search up uh, Nest Talk Podcast or my name, Chris Linfont, on iTunes to find it very quickly. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe. It always helps the channel. Watch some of our other videos. Maybe you haven't seen our Nikhil Harry um, prospect review that, that a lot of people like. Uh, I thought I did it well, and I think it gives a very good insight into what Nikhil Harry is. Like, again, my current favorite favorite player in this draft, Nikhil Harry. You can go watch that that draft review. Um, uh, make sure to check out BaltimoreFeather.com for the latest and greatest Ravens news and opinion articles. Uh, and then, of course, whenever a podcast is posted, you can find it there as well. Um, you can follow me at Chris Linfont on Twitter. Follow the blog at Be More Feather on Twitter. And make sure to like us on Facebook if you find us there. Just search up Nest Talk or Baltimore Feather on Facebook. Okay, so Chris Linfont signing out uh, here on April 10th, 2019. We'll see you next week as we get even closer to the NFL draft. <laughs>